So this is um, uh, a fun program. This is a little different. So we have a sort of a presentation and uh, kind of a little bit of a personal accounts too that we're going to be bringing to you today. So I'm going to introduce today's panelists and then turn things over to them. Writer and historian Bill Beck has more than 30 years of experience writing about business and industrial history. He wrote his first history for Minnesota Power in 1985 and has more than 100 published books to his credit. In central Indiana, he has written anniversary books for Park Tudor School, Indiana Gas Company, Riley Industries, the Indianapolis Business Journal, uh, the Millennial Project, and the Indianapolis 500 Festival, as well as the IHSAA and St. Vincent Hospital. Bill is a 1971 graduate of Marion University in Indianapolis and did his graduate work in American history at the University of North Dakota. He started Lakeside Writers Group in 1988, following 10 years as a reporter for newspapers in Minnesota and North Carolina, and seven years as a senior writer in the public affairs department at Minnesota Power. He lives in the Irvington neighborhood of Indianapolis with Elizabeth, his wife of 55 years, and he's been a member of the Marion County Historical Society for nearly a quarter century. He's currently researching a history of the North American copper industry in the late 19th and early 20th centuries and writing a memoir for his three grandchildren. Stephen Deerdorf, MD, was born in Terre Haute, but his father was a physician in the US Air Force, and so his family moved around frequently. Dr. Deerdorf graduated from high school in Terre Haute and then college um, from DePauw University. He earned his MD at Indiana School of Medicine and completed an anesthesiology residency in Indianapolis before serving for two years in the United States Navy. Professionally, he worked for the Department of Anesthesia at uh, Indiana University for 31 years and the Department of Anesthesiology at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston for seven years. So over the years, he's lived in numerous places, including Indiana, Michigan, California, Pennsylvania, Alabama, North and South Carolina, and in England as well. And finally, Dr. Bill McNeese is a lifelong resident of Indianapolis with roots in Southern Indiana. He's a graduate of Rose Holman Institute of Technology and Indiana, excuse me, Indiana University School of Medicine. And he is a physician and practicing anesthesiologist. He serves as the president of the Marion County Historical Society, and his historical interests include anesthesia and anesthesiology, history, uh, local history, and industrial history as well. So thank you to all of our panelists for being here with us this afternoon for what I think will be a really fascinating presentation. I'm going to turn things over now to Dr. McNeese, who uh, is going to tell you a little bit about the Marion County Historical Society and also kind of get the event rolling. So I'm going to I'm going to disappear now. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. I'm Bill McNeese, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon. I'm delighted you're here this afternoon. Uh, so, uh, so pleased we can be connected here. The Marion County Historical Society, and I should point out there are 17 Marion counties and various states across the nation. So if you just Google Marion County Historical Society, who knows where you're going to end up? So Google Marion County Historical Society, Indianapolis, or the website www.mchsindy.org, and that will get us, uh, get us connected. The Marion County Historical Society presents, oh, eight to 12 programs a year. Traditionally, these have been cited often in areas of historical significance within the county. We've been doing a lot more Zoom of late, and we'll see what the next year brings. But um, we invite your interest. Please have a, a look, and uh, perhaps we'll see you again at, a, at another program here or somewhere else in the future. With that, let me try and share a screen here. Here we go. You... So you should be something now, seeing something now that says Polio in Indianapolis, a timeline. Uh, Sarah, are we okay? You're good. Okay, let's proceed then. Maybe. Okay, well, let's begin just by talking a little bit about polio as, a, as an entity. I've got listed here a dozen or so different names 
um, both in English and in French and in German to try and describe the same entity here. And I'll use primarily the last three in the list, infantile paralysis, poliomyelitis, and primarily polio as I, as I speak of it. Some features to the, to the disease, it is caused by a virus. The virus is transmitted primarily through uh, fecal oral transmission, although it can be transmitted by droplets, uh, particularly early on in the, in the illness uh, where you uh, may have some pharyngeal infection. About 70% of infections are asymptomatic. Hmm. Okay. Try some more options here. Okay, here is a, uh, I think an interesting slide uh, and I will not do that. I will do this. Um, and there we go. So looking at this slide, we can see polio uh, here in this portion. And this has a, a list of 30 or 40 different illnesses in it. And they are oriented here so that the more infectious an entity is, it gets moved out further to the right. So th these are more in, um, contagious than things over here. And as you're moving from the bottom up, things become more deadly. So you can see where polio is in relation to smallpox or uh, SARS-CoV-2 or uh, typhoid or tuberculosis or diphtheria. So it's not as infectious as measles or whooping cough. It's um, not as deadly as tuberculosis or the bubonic plague, but it's a significant disease. And when we talk about this level of um, uh, deadliness, we're talking about uh, specifically the uh, the paralysis producing uh, aspects of the disease. So if about 70% are um, not uh, symptomatic, uh, about a quarter of them are. And this looks not unlike um, a number of other childhood illnesses, a little fever, a little headache, some vomiting, diarrhea, and full recovery after two or three days. A small percentage will proceed on to have evidence of meningeal irritation with neck stiffness, but no muscle weakness. About 1% proceed on to have muscle weakness or paralysis that develops within a few days of onset. And this is more common in adolescents and adults as compared to infants and children. And in children with muscle weakness or paralysis, they vary in terms of uh, spinal polio, so weakness of arms and legs, bulbar affecting muscles of swallowing and respirations, and spinal bulbar affecting both. There's usually no effect on sensation or cognition, but there is a significant fatality rate with paralytic polio. And you can see here, uh, it's a higher incidence as you um, move into older patients and to those with, with bulbar involvement. We'll have a little mention of post-polio syndrome, but not much. That's a recurrent muscle weakness that occurs decades after the primary infection. As a disease, there's some evidence that it existed uh, as far back as ancient, ancient Egypt, and it's described in the 16th century. So here is um, a mention of this. Um, I showed every sign of health and strength until I was about 18 months old. One night I have been told, I was great reluctance to go to bed. I was being chased around, finally um, put to bed. And that's the last time I was able to show much personal agility. In the morning, I was discovered to be affected with a fever that often accompanies the cutting of large teeth. And then when they went to bathe me on day four, I'd lost the power of my right leg. Impatience of a child soon inclined me to struggle with my infirmity. And it goes on to conclude by um, my lameness apart, I was an otherwise sturdy child. So the conveyor of this information is Sir Walter Scott. And if you try to trace this back, he was born in August of 1771, 
So his encounter with polio that left him with a lifelong debility uh, was uh, in February of 1771. About, um, and certainly, although it was not used the term polio, it was consistent with that. About 16 years later, writing in England, Michael Underwood uh, talks about the diseases of children, and he um, talks about uh, debility of the lower extremities. And he uh, talks about this disease, not common, but it occurs, I've seen some of it, uh, and he goes on to describe it, uh, usually attacks children previously reduced by fever, not usually under one, not usually more than four or five, um, talks about then uh, how this presents and the weakness of the lower extremities, gradually becoming more infirm and after a few weeks are unable to support the body, goes on to talk about the um, various approaches to it uh, with this um, entity that he's describing there. So. Um, late 1700s, a description consistent with polio. This is a communication from 1894 in Vermont from the uh, State Board of Health there, and it describes uh, an early description of a, an epidemic of polio uh, in the city of Rutland. Um, all of this in the Otter Creek Valley uh, so a, a fairly narrow geographic area here, and almost all of the cases were within this valley. He goes on to describe several examples, and here's one of a three-year-old boy, previously healthy, moderate fever, irritable, no nausea, no, nausea, no uh, diarrhea. After two or three days, febrile symptoms abated, uh, but then it became clear that the, the boy was not able to use his legs extensor muscles clearly affected, couldn't walk, could not stand steadily for 10 days. At the end of that time, he began to use his legs in walking and at three weeks time had fully recovered. So um, uh, a typical example here. And he pointed out that it was consistent with two things. One was meningitis, another was poliomyelitis. And he concluded uh, from uh, his, um, interpretation, although there was others that disagreed, uh, it's consistent with epidemic poliomyelitis. Flexner, uh, working in 1910 in an experimental model, uh, was able to uh, confirm that uh, this uh, was epidemic and of a, of a viral nature uh, and work that confirmed work previously done uh, in Europe uh, a, few years, a few years earlier. Well, if we move to Indianapolis, um, we can see that uh, there was descriptions of the uh, infantile paralysis uh, in Indianapolis in the um, basic newspapers of the time, the Indianapolis News, the Indianapolis Star, are the ones that I'll be looking at with you today. And if we uh, read some of this article, uh, talks about epidemics and where they are, uh, where they have been, the worst time of year seems to be the warmer months of the year, and the scourge usually disappears with the advent of cold weather. And that's something that we'll see uh, repeatedly over the course of the afternoon here. This is a political poster for uh, the Democratic candidates for presidential and vice presidential office in 1908. And I'll draw your attention to the vice presidential candidate, John W. Kern um, from Indianapolis. And his son, John W. Kern Jr. Uh, sustained um, infantile uh, paralysis, polio in October of that year while his father, John Kern Sr. Uh, was campaigning uh, for uh, the office of vice presidency uh, across the nation. So it describes uh, the little fellow here, not able to move either arm or leg, but is improving some. Uh, it made uh, the front page of the New York Times uh, describing this uh, youngster, um, unable to move any of his limbs for, the, for a time, but now able to move one leg and one arm a little. His uh, father is called back to home um, on the 21st because his mother is growing increasingly concerned about the boy's condition uh, 
uh, father does return and uh, the following day there's a note that well his condition is serious but it's not growing worse um, and so he um, goes on from there um, and I missed a slide in there but uh, Kern uh, does not uh, succeed in his campaign for uh, uh, for vice president um, but he uh, uh, goes on from there uh, there is mention here of polio epidemics um, in the United States in the summer of 1916. Uh, lots of um, uh, reports of polio across the country and in New York City alone, a substantial number uh, of uh, incidents of the, of the illness. Here is a, an article from the Indianapolis newspapers talking about the epidemic in New York. So it's well known here in the Indianapolis area. And if we look at data from the yearbook of the state of Indiana from 1916-17, uh, they list the incidences of various illnesses uh, by month. And so if we just pick some months in Indiana, uh, we can see that in January, uh, polio is listed, but it's the last among the incidents of everything here with influenza, influenza being at the top of the list. By April, still not much polio being seen. But as we move into July, it starts to move up further on the list. Note that typhoid fever is the most frequent. It moves up still further in September, and then it drops back again by December. So showing a typical time-wise pattern of an increase uh, in incidence in uh, the warmer summer months and gradually disappearing in the winter months. It caused the closure of some schools. And I'll back up, um, I'll now diverge a little bit to talk about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, born in 1882, um, New York State Senator and the Democratic candidate for vice president in 1920. Here's an image of FDR on the left, along with James Cox and the candidate for president in 1920. So they were defeated by Warren Harding, Calvin Coolidge. FDR goes under practice law in New York City and in August of 1921, travels off to vac his vacation home in Campobello off Maine. August the 11th, he notes fever and that one leg felt weak and progressing to weakness in both legs by the evening. Over the next days, he's seen by multiple physicians. There's a clinical diagnosis of polio that's made. On September the 14th, so about a month later, he's transported to New York City and admitted to Presbyterian Hospital by George Draper. He's there um, as an inpatient for about six weeks before being released to home with um, a note and another uh, reference saying that he really wasn't improving. Now you wouldn't know that by reading the Indianapolis literature. So here FDR has infantile paralysis, but he's nearing recovery. The same George Draper here, who is uh, his admitting physician. Um, he is slowly nearing recovery, power to control the affected muscles of lower legs and feet is beginning to return I can't say how long Mr. Roosevelt will be in the kept in the hospital, but you can say definitely he will not be crippled and no one need have any fear of permanent injury in any way from this attack. Well, it didn't turn out that way. So the clinical diagnosis, the working diagnosis and the public awareness of all this remained that FDR had polio. Although reassessment decades later suggests that Guillain Barre might in fact have been the correct diagnosis but in a sense that's irrelevant because uh, everyone uh, was of the uh, sense that polio was the cause of um, his uh, long-term uh, leg weakness. He recovers function of arms, but not legs, speaks at the Democratic Convention, is elected governor of New York, um, and is elected president of the United States in 1932, uh, elected for the first time. And I'll make mention in 1938, he announces the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, later known as the March of Dimes, that plays an important role as we talk about polio. This is one of the rare images of FDR in a wheelchair. Uh, 
uh, with um, um, a young girl by his side there and, and the dog in his lap. Uh, but he was uh, fairly careful to not uh, demonstrate um, his presence in a wheelchair, um, only very rarely. Well, let's talk, move back to Indiana and talk about Indiana in, um, in these years, uh, early part of the 20th century. And we can see here morbidity, so the incidence of the illness over a 12-month period in 24 and 25, and if we look here at poliomyelitis, it's present, but clearly um, magnitude of, of orders of difference as compared to tuberculosis or uh, chickenpox or measles, uh, diphtheria, influenza. So it's present, but not in large numbers. If we do a comparison, noting that earlier times are on the right, later on the left, we can see that it's. Uh, it goes up and down a little bit, but still not anywhere near uh, looking now at deaths as compared to other causes, uh, tuberculosis, pneumonia, diarrhea in uh, infants and, and young children. So it's present, but not in large quantities as compared to other uh, causes of death here. Um, and if we um, normalize this on a basis of per 100,000, and we can uh, see this is uh, not uh, a big entity. If we then move on to look at the period from 1925 to 1934, there was a spike up here in, in 1927, uh, again, total deaths, uh, but still not large numbers and not increasing greatly over time. Now this was from the 1935 Almanac, and I'll make mention here of this person who we've talked about before, but not seen before. So this is an image of John W. Kern. It's really John W. Kern Jr. So that young man who developed polio in 1908 goes on to become uh, the then youngest mayor uh, of the city of Indianapolis. Uh, here in, um, in 1935 uh, at his uh, swearing-in ceremony. You'll note that he's got um, a crutch here, and he so continued to have uh, effects from his early encounter with polio uh, throughout his life. Uh, here's an image of Kern sitting next to FDR during a campaign event in 1936 and an image of Kern uh, during the course of his uh, career as mayor uh, of Indianapolis before going on um, after a shortened term to accept an appointment uh, by FDR. If we look at the period from 1935 to 1944, 1940 was, was a bad year, but again, not big differences uh, here into um, 1944. If we look at polio, it's there. The numbers are a little bit bigger, but still not anywhere near as large as some of the other diseases of the time. If we normalize these out on, uh, on a basis of population, we can see that Marion County is, I don't know, perhaps a third of the way up from the bottom. And if we look at the ones that are really concerning, J. Randolph Union and Adams, uh, clearly in their own class as compared to most of the other counties. And if we look at this at a, at a state map, we can see all of these clumped together uh, in Eastern Indiana. Um, morbidity over a period of time. Now note that this is, this is the reverse. So here is the earlier dates here and the later dates here. And we can see that the morbidity of poliomyelitis is gradually increasing over time. We saw 1940 had a rise there. And over time, we're seeing bigger numbers than we were seeing earlier and a greater number of deaths than we were seeing earlier. If we look at the total deaths, we can see that the number of deaths are becoming uh, greater and those due to, for example, diphtheria, 
and whooping cough are decreasing. So uh, polio is becoming a more significant, uh, more seen uh, illness here in the 1950s than it was as compared to other illnesses in previous decades. Um, here we have uh, a typical pattern uh, in this year, and we can see these summer months is when we're seeing polio arising. Not so much uh, in the winter, but it rises here during the, the warm summer months. And if we look at this, looking at case numbers and number of deaths, it's a much more common illness in uh, infants and children, but on a relative sense, the death rate is higher uh, as you get in to look at, at the older population. Let's look at a few articles now from the Indianapolis Star, the Indianapolis News. Uh, take precautions during polio season, your baby and mine. Uh, avoid overtiring and, and extreme fatigue, avoid sudden chilling. Pay attention to personal hygiene. Use the purest milks, don't swim in polluted waters. Um, general advice here on uh, taking care of your, of your child. 1946, and we're seeing the se seasonal rise here. 1947, um, Dr. Van Riper of the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, remember begun by, um, by Roosevelt, um, looking at a, a speaking uh, here in town, uh, searching for something like a penicillin, uh, that would be very effective, but that seems to be less successful than uh, hopefully we'll have see success uh, seen uh, with the desperately needed uh, vaccine. On the polio front, uh, later that year, um, no parent relishes limiting children's play, but physicians warn repeatedly against allowing youngsters to become overly fatigued or suddenly chilled. The battle against polio means, uh, means constant vigilance. So the press pointing out repeatedly to parents uh, about the concern for polio uh, and approaches to try and reduce its likelihood uh, for their child. Here's a, an approach. Um, I find this one sort of an interesting approach. They're using a DDT um, day. And what they were sending out here was um, 8,000 spray gun armed Boy Scouts sweeping, uh, sweeping through metropolitan uh, Indianapolis to uh, spread DDT and try and kill flies. Uh, probably not something that we contemplate today. Um, early 1948, uh, talking about the March of Dimes, um, their campaign and making an, an early uh, appeal for support. Fremont Power, a columnist in the Indianapolis News, uh, puts together a series of articles uh, talking about polio and talking about um, polio as, a, as an entity. He goes in to talk about the various types of polio, encephalitis, bulbar, peripheral, respiratory, uh, and what was involved in trying to take our patients with those uh, entities. And then in the last of the series, he talks about precautions against the, the disease. Don't mingle with crowds, don't swim in, in pools, don't become excessively fatigued, suddenly chilled. This one makes sense. Don't eat food that's possibly soiled by discharges from other bodies. Uh, and then continuing on to live in dwellings that don't live in dwellings that they, you can't keep the flies out. 1949. Uh, the polio season has started, and so there is communications that's going out. Avoid crowds, fatigue, practice good sanitation. Uh, didn't think that the last year was a, as an epidemic year, and uh, we'll hope it's not this year. However, there was some ongoing um, uh, polio that was seen, and there was a question of, does the state fair need to be postponed or canceled? State Fair didn't open until September, uh, and they were uh, trying to make a decision as to, as to what to do. And from there, I'll pause for a minute and let Bill Beck talk for a while. 
and talk on his memories of growing up on the north side of Indianapolis. I've kind of presented here what parents in the late 1940s would be reading about polio and Bill can talk about his experiences as a, as a young lad in the early 1950s. Bill, you're on. Okay, thank you, Dr. McNeese. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, everybody for joining us today. Um, my most vivid memory of the polio epidemics of the late 1940s and early 1950s um, take place uh, during the summer. Uh, and say 1951, 1952, I was six or seven years old. I had two younger brothers um, who were five and four. And back in those days, um, we didn't have water parks like they have today, um, where you've got all the sprays and, um, and uh, what have you. Uh, but what we did have for a hot summer day was the family garden hose with a sprinkler uh, hooked up to it. And if you were a kid, you could put your bathing trunks on and go run through the sprinkler for um, half an hour. Um, and there was some time in there, and it was probably 51, 52, uh, where my mother just said, you're not gonna do that because you'll get chilled it's hot out, you'll get cold, and you'll be susceptible to polio. Now, um, I've had discussions with contemporaries, and a number of people remember that. Um, uh, my wife, who grew up down in Beach Grove and is about a year younger than I am, um, uh, has exactly the same memories of her mother coming out and, and saying, no, you're not going to run through the sprinkler like you did last summer. Um, and you've seen the newspaper articles, the recommendations from the medical community not to get chilled. So I understand. I suspect it had uh, somewhat to do um, the, the, uh, the fascination with polio. Um, had a great deal to do with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And um, his was a case, as, as I understand it, of having gotten chilled in the waters of the Bay of Fundy um, at Campobello um, and, and developed uh, the fever that, that led to his condition. Well, that greatest generation, my parents' generation, um, they were acutely aware of polio because of Franklin, Franklin Roosevelt. And, um, and I, I do remember that there was no 51, 52. Um, there was talk, there was hope that there was going to be um, a vaccine for polio, but it wasn't there yet. It wouldn't arrive until 1955. So uh, until I was 10 years old and vaccinated, um, I never really got to run through the sprinkler when I was a kid. And we didn't have air conditioning back in those days. So sprinkler was a big deal. I, we didn't get to, when I left the, the house to go into the Air Force in 1965, we still didn't have um, central air conditioning at the house on 46th Street. So that's my story. That's my memories of um, the, the fear that polio engendered in the early 1950s. Bill? Right. Let's move on. And we'll talk a little bit about Riley Hospital for Children. This is an image from uh, early uh, in its years. Um, and this um, is, uh, was at the time the main entrance. Uh, it's in fact still there, but it's now surrounded by buildings. So you have to look carefully if you're, if you're going to find that. But this was the building. And this is the first patient to be admitted. Uh, this is uh, Mark Noble. Uh, 
Uh, he is at the time a 10 year old coming in with his parents from Decatur County uh, to try and uh, hopefully see an improvement uh, from his uh, leg weakness uh, due to polio that he had uh, uh, sustained earlier. A few years later, um, 1925 to 1930, then this structure is built here. And this is the Ward K unit uh, for the Kiwanis unit. And it was built as a 50 bed unit designed primarily for children with orth orthopedic problems. So that's 1930. And in 1935, there is opened up the hydrotherapy pool at Riley. So here is an occupational therapist and a young patient uh, in the hydrotherapy pool, something really uh, promoted um, uh, by uh, Roosevelt uh, through his uh, efforts to try and uh, improve uh, his overall health. This is the image of it uh, on the day of its opening um, with um, individuals uh, coming to, to recognize the uh, opening of this uh, and in hope that it uh, uh, will provide uh, an opportunity for patients of Riley children of Indiana uh, to recover from, from polio. This is a, an image from, uh, I think it's 1936. It's a little hard for me to see somehow here. Uh, but uh, this is an image of uh, Roosevelt uh, coming by the window to the hydrotherapy pool, uh, looks out and here's a, a young patient here and um, a, a therapist of some sort here uh, as they were, uh, Roosevelt and the young patient were uh, talking uh, and um, he was, uh, the article explains, very pleased at this to see uh, this advanced um, therapeutic pool available to the patients in, in Indianapolis. Um, an image here, uh, 1945, of some Boy Scouts uh, who are inpatients at Riley Hospital. And they're, uh, as they're describing an overnight hike, uh, they're being moved by beds or wheelchairs, but uh, trying to have a normalization of experience uh, of um, uh, Boy Scouts uh, enjoying uh, getting together and uh, their uh, experience as a um, some normalization of their lives as, as best they could. There's a few more articles that I'll um, look at with you here. And this is not exactly what I'd like, but we'll, we'll make this work. So um, false rumors make polio task harder. Um, and what they're pointing out here is, you know, trying to get good sources of information and the challenge that are presented by um, false information that's being circulated. But if you read the article looking within it, I think there's several things that are worth looking at. Um, Riley has 16 iron lungs, the respirators for acute polio patients, uh, a total of 98 polio patients being treated, finest of equipment for the treatment of all stages of the disease, three times as many respirators as ever have been gathered. Talk some about the Sister Kenny hot pack machines. Um, and then over here, um, talking about do that. I can't do that. Um, the um, the what Riley is doing to uh, try to take good care of the patients. Do a couple more things. Do that that and it should make it go a little better. And Okay. Here's an image, 1948, uh, polio victims future at stake. And so this uh, senior student nurse here is applying hot packs uh, to the um, uh, young child stricken limbs here. And uh, Steve will probably talk more about this uh, approach 
uh, in a little bit. Here is an example of a young man uh, from Petersburg. So patients from all across the state coming to Riley. Um, big grin for his dog um, with the, the dog Skeeter here sitting atop the iron lung uh, that this young man is um, being treated with to try to improve his um, ventilation. Um, so an example of a Riley youngster uh, in an iron lung from 1950. A pediatrician here examining a youngster. And what this is pointing out is the importance of trying to get good diagnostic information uh, about the disease and be sure that it's, it's really polio and not something else uh, that's going on with the youngster. And with that, I'll introduce Steve Deerdorf, uh, who will speak for a few minutes. And uh, I have here on the right, um, a image of Indiana. This is Pike County here. And within Pike County is the town of Winslow. And um, Steve, you're on. Okay, thanks, Bill and Bill. Okay, these are some of my recollections of a five-year-old having polio in the summer of uh, 1953. Um, I guess, yeah, okay. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out, this is a very good book written by David Oshinsky in 2005 on uh, polio. Uh, if you really want a comprehensive look at the whole polio issue, uh, this is a great book to read. Okay, go on, Bill. Yep. Uh, what I'd like to cover are some of my personal experiences, talk about Elizabeth Kenny's therapy, uh, a little bit about the vaccine development and also post-polio syndrome. Uh, so in June of 1953, my father was a general practice physician in Winslow. Winslow at that time had a population of about 1,500. I think its population in the last census was about 900. I do remember a day or two laying on the couch in the living room with meningitic type symptoms, headaches, stiff neck, some generalized muscle aches, and then I was taken to Riley Hospital. And in Riley, they do a history and physical exam and then the spinal tap. Uh, when I read accounts of others my age who had polio, the spinal tap sticks out in their memory. Uh, today, we usually heavily sedate children for spinal taps, but in those days, not they just held you down and did it. So after that, I was admitted to Ward K that Bill showed you a picture of. Ward K was divided into several cubicles. There were six beds per cubicle, and each cubicle had a wall between you and the next cubicle, but it did not extend up to the ceiling. It was plywood on the bottom and then frosted glass, but I could stand up in my bed and peer over the wall into the next cubicle and chat with the other kids. Um, I didn't go back, uh, go back when I didn't go back to Ward K until I was a junior in medical school because I remember as a child, I thought that was about the biggest place in the world. And then when I went back as a medical student, I realized it's not really that, that big, but that's typical your memories of a five year old compared to an adult. Okay, next slide. So the treatment then, and they were very much into the Sister Kenny therapy, was hot packs three times a day. Everybody who had polio in Ward K had a boiler underneath their bed. And they would heat up these uh, wool khaki blankets. I suspect they were probably army surplus blankets. You would get wrapped in a couple layers of dry wool blankets and then two to three layers of wet hot blankets and then one layer of dry blankets. And Riley wasn't air conditioned then, and it was in the summer, so it was pretty warm. Uh, the student nurses, I remember them, they wore, they had pink blouses, white starch skirts, and light gray kind of apron frocks over their uniform. And they were pretty nice because they would cool the blankets off a little bit before they put them on you. The nurses aide who did it sometimes, it was straight out of the boiler on, onto you. Uh, 
they do some muscle massage. I do remember the hydrotherapy. I called it the swimming pool. I was somewhat chagrined that I didn't get to go more often, but I always found that to be pleasant. I uh, have no recollection of having any paralysis of any muscles. Uh, my father said the only residual, I have some atrophy of my tongue, not terribly much, but he said that was the re residual, which didn't make a lot of sense because that would imply more bulbar involvement. So I should have had some respiratory issues, but I had none of those. So uh, I don't remember any paralysis at all. Next slide, Bill. Uh, the parents could visit on Sunday afternoon. And I think my one or both my parents came almost every Sunday. Um, and that was a trick for my father since he was really the only physician in town. The other incident, I remember one night we pulled our comic books in our cubicle and tore them apart page by page, made paper airplanes and threw, flew them around the ward. The night nurse came in with a large push broom and swept them out. She was not very happy, but I remember that incident fairly distinctly. I suppose it was the childish re rebellion to not having much control over your environment. Next slide. Elizabeth Kenny was what was called an Australian bush nurse. She probably had no formal training, although she, she said she did, but there's no record. She probably more like an apprenticeship. Uh, she had some fairly strong feelings that polio was a primary muscle disease. She never embraced the pathogenesis as being that to affect the spinal cord. She felt the key to therapy was muscle relaxation and the manipulation, uh, you needed heat from the hot pack followed by massage and motion. Her approach was not well accepted by us, and so she came to the United States. Next slide. In 1938, uh, she got a fairly poor reception in Chicago and New York to the medical establishment, and I think it was a case of two stubborn groups uh, getting together. She was described by many as being stubborn, had a sharp tongue, a tireless self-promoter, a large woman who wore large hats. She contended that her success rate for treatment was versus 10 to 15% in conventional therapy. Uh, nobody could either prove or disprove this because there were no controlled studies ever done. She did, however, have a better reception uh, with the Pedic chairman of the Mayo Clinic, who referred her to Minneapolis, where there had been a recent outbreak of polio. Next slide. Um, Basil O'Connor is a very important name in polio. He was really the administrative head of the National Foundation of Infantile Paralysis, and he was Roosevelt's law partner. That's how he got on. Uh, to this position. Uh, but O'Connor did not like uh, Elizabeth Kenny, so he denied her a grant. So she developed her own fundraising apparatus. Interestingly, the Kenny Institute was investigated by the Minnesota Attorney General, who at that time was Walter Mondale, who issued a favorable, unfavorable report about use of the money. In 1957, Marvin Klein, who was a former mayor of Minneapolis and became the executive director of the Kenny Foundation, was convicted of fraud and sent to 10 years in prison. Next slide. Um, this is a picture of Elizabeth Kenny. And over to the right is a photo. My daughter lives in Minneapolis, and this is a, uh, the site of the original Kenny Institute. I'm not sure if this is the original building, but the Kenny Institute still exists in the Alina healthcare system in Minnesota, and it's used for physical uh, therapy. Uh, Kenny left the U.S. in 1951 and died in Australia in 1952. Next slide. I think to put her therapy in perspective, the conventional therapy 
at that time was more splints and casting. And Kenny recommended muscle relaxation and use. However, as I mentioned before, there were never any control studies comparing the two. And I think given my choice, the Kenny therapy may have been the lesser of two evils. Uh, her uh, approach did provide a basis for modern physical therapy, and she is given some credit uh, by the founding fathers of physical medicine for some of her uh, treatments. So there's good and bad. I wanted to talk a little bit about the vaccine. The story is, is really intriguing. Uh, Salk, uh, one of the killed inactivated virus, whereas most virologists felt that a live attenuated virus was better based on things like smallpox vaccines. So Salk became the figurehead for the uh, killed vaccine and Sabin the kind of the figurehead for um, the attenuated. Salk was born in New York in 1914. He started college to study law, but found he was better suited for sciences. Uh, graduated from the NYU College of Medicine. Uh, he was recruited to the University of Michigan by Thomas Francis, who will play an important role later in the polio story to study influenza. Influenza was a major problem in World War II, uh, not that it killed a lot of soldiers, but it certainly made them sick and took them off the line. Uh, so, and that's what a lot of the virologists in that era, including Sabin, did during World War II. Um, he spent six years at Michigan and then was hired by the University of Pittsburgh to start a virology lab. And this was funded by the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis. And the man named Harry Weaver was sort of the administrative head of research. Weaver was not a scientist, but he had a knack for uh, developing people who could do research, and he changed a lot of the ways the grants were administered, and he was certainly much more interested in results. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other, Sabin was born in Poland, came to the U.S. at age 15. He started dental school, but said he hated dentistry but loved the science. So he went to medical school. He did some work at the virology lab at the Lister Institute. And he was recruited to the Rockefeller Institute. The Rockefeller Institute was probably one of the premier research centers in the, in the United States, uh, particularly with virology. Um, and he was described as a tireless researcher who uh, didn't delegate a lot of the work. He did a lot of the very tedious work and research himself. He was eventually recruited to the University of Cincinnati uh, Children's Hospital. So they were the two kind of protagonists. Go ahead, Bill. Now, <clears throat> it's wrong to think that one or two people developed this vaccine. There were all sorts of discoveries that had to be made. Uh, Bodian was important because he identified three types of the polio virus. John Enders, uh, who won the Nobel Prize later, uh, realized and developed the technique for cultivating the virus in the test tube. Prior to Enders' discovery, most of the virus had to be grown in uh, nervous uh, system tissue, primarily in monkey, but trying to use this in humans uh, would often produce a kind of an immune encephalomyelitis. So this was an important discovery. The first person to actually immunize an animal with a killed virus was Isabel Morgan. Uh, next slide. This is Isabel Morgan. And I'd like to say a few words about her. Next slide. Morgan was the daughter of Thomas Morgan, who was a, a won the Nobel Prize in 1933 for his work with chromosomes and heredity. She was educated at Stanford and the University of Pennsylvania and joined the Rockefeller Institute. Uh, as typical at that time, uh, 
women in those positions were paid about half of what her fellow males were paid. And she didn't see much uh, chance of advancement. So she took a position at Johns Hopkins. And she was the first to immunize monkeys with a chilled virus vaccine. Unfortunately for the polio story, in 1949, at the peak of her career, and everybody agreed she was a phenomenal researcher, she left Hopkins, got married to raise a family, and really never got back into virology research after that. And unfortunately, no one at Hopkins continued her research. It's possible if she had been allowed to continue her research, we would have called it the Morgan vaccine, not the Salk vaccine. Uh, next slide. Um, so uh, the viruses were killed with formaldehyde and, and probably one of Salk's great achievements was he was a uh, very good researcher in developing processes and he developed a very specific process for killing the virus and then activating it. Next slide. Another interesting character in the story was a man named Hilary Kaprowski, who came from Poland. Uh, he initially took a position at the Rockefeller Foundation in Brazil and ultimately was hired by a commercial lab, Leatherly Labs, that was the medical arm of American cyanamide. He developed an attenuated live virus vaccine and actually tested it on children in 1950. And he did this in a place called Letchworth Village in New York, which was a state institution for the quote, feeble-minded and epileptic. Uh, he referred to these subjects as volunteers. I doubt that he really got much consent and I'm sure it would have been, would be considered unethical today, but. He was probably the first to actually test a virus in humans. Next slide. <clears throat> Field trials for the Salk vaccine began in 1954. And the two pharmaceutical companies that provided the vaccine, Reli Lilly and Park Davis. I, you remember I mentioned Thomas Francis because he hired Salk at the University of Michigan, but all the data collection an analysis was done by Thomas Francis and his group at the University of Michigan. And this uh, field test comprised 1.3 million children with controls. Uh, it took over a year to analyze all the data. Uh, not an easy task even today with computers, but all this had to be done by hand. And it really involved tens of thousands of volunteers submitting data and doing follow-up uh, contacts with the children and their parents. The results were announced um, publicly on April 12, 1955, which was the 10th anniversary of Roosevelt's death. And the results were that the vaccine was 60 to 90% effective depending on what type of polio virus was involved. Uh, next slide. There was a infamous incident called the Cutter Incident. After uh, the trials, there were four other uh, pharmaceutical companies that were licensed for soft vaccine production, one of which was the Cutter Laboratories in Berkeley, California. Um, and there were probably 200 cases of polio linked to the Cutter vaccine. And at Cutter, they actually bottled the vaccine in the same room that they inactivated the live virus. They were the only company to do that. So there was some live virus in those vaccine batches. Um, it's unclear whether the live virus became a contaminant or whether it was inadequate inactivation. Uh, interestingly, a third of the Cutter vaccine batches were tested and actually had live virus. But Cutter discarded these and never reported them to the NFIP, uh, which uh, really wouldn't be acceptable reporting today. But the Cutter incident really rippled through polio vaccines for actually decades 
uh, after that. Uh, in fact, I think it was even referred to once uh, with respect to COVID, but uh, next slide. Sabin tested his attenuated virus vaccine on first on 30 prisoners in Chillicothe, Ohio. Again, I'm not exactly sure about the ethics of that, but he had contacts in Russia. So his vaccine was first tested on 10 million Russian children in 1959, and there were no controls. The Sabin vaccine did become popular around the world because of ease of administration. It was oral and you only needed one dose. And in 1963, the Sabin vaccine replaced the Salk vaccine as the recommended vaccine. However, uh, later the Salk vaccine became the standard initial vaccine in the, in the United States. Sabin and Salk did not get along. There were many reports of meeting of the virologists being very contentious uh, between the two. Uh, next slide. To put these in, in perspective, many discoveries were required by many investigators and kind of a building block of knowledge building on knowledge. Early human testing would certainly be considered unethical today. Ultimately, the killed vaccine did dominate in the US. Uh, vaccination has markedly reduced polio worldwide, but occasionally there are some fresh outbreaks. There was one in West Africa in 2004 when the local politicians said that the vaccine caused AIDS and infertility. Sound familiar? Uh, next slide. Post-polio syndrome, having had polio, I followed this literature fairly closely. I honestly don't think I have any symptoms I think any problems I have are just natural aging. For now, almost 600,000 polio survivors in the U.S. and 15 to 80 percent of these develop post-polio syndrome. This is generally characterized by muscle weakness or fatigability and fractures of the affected limbs. Uh, there are many theories. The most likely is that the virus initially attacks the anterior horn cells that supply nerve impulse to your muscles. And the polio virus kills these off. So the remaining ones, if you like hypertrophy, send out new axons. And over the years, they become overworked and, and they will die off or become affected as well. I think this is probably the most accepted uh, theory today. Uh, next slide. So what I remember, I remember the meningitic symptoms. I remember the spinal tap and the smell of hot, wet wool blankets. And as I read accounts of others my age who had polio, the two things that stick out in their mind are the spinal tap and the smell of hot, wet wool blankets. Um, a few years ago, my wife and I were in Washington, D.C. We had a free afternoon, so we went to the Smithsonian, and they had a temporary exhibit on the um, polio epidemics. And as we're working way, our way through it, when they got to the part about Sister Kenny and the hot packs, I told my wife, I've seen enough, I've lived it, I'm going to go look at some other exhibit, and left her to finish going through it. But... Um, even today, the smell of hot, wet wool blankets brings back olfactory memories of the hot pack treatment. And those are my recollections of polio. Okay, thanks, Steve. And uh, I'll finish up with uh, just a little bit more. And then we'll uh, be done uh, for the afternoon here. So uh, March 31st of 55, uh, uh, great news coming out about uh, the success of the Salk vaccine. This is an important front page from April the 12th of 1955. And I'll point out five different things. First, Salk vaccine is safe, potent, and effective and becomes licensed after the official report. All of this was paid for by the March of Dimes, um, really funding the research that uh, resulted in the, the vaccine. 
um, 95 percent of parents okay people shot shot so uh, the city uh, had a system already developed so that all first and second graders would receive uh, vaccine shots of the salk vaccine without uh, cost and uh, they uh, was 95 percent of the parents said yes we we want to do that Interestingly, of the remaining 5%, a lot of them said, well, thanks, but we're just going to get done with our uh, personal doctor. So in fact, the number uh, was higher than that in terms of the youngsters getting the shots. Uh, and then uh, the two images here at the bottom, orders pouring in. So there was a great demand for the vaccines. The uh, success here in our Suribachi, uh, Iwo Jima reference here, uh, and the success of the Salk vaccine and the March of Dimes campaign in overcoming polio. Uh, the next day here, thrilled by Salk success, Indiana's doctors act to immunize and very quickly rushing out the polio vaccine. Interestingly, there was a, at least one uh, group in Clay County, the physician group said that, uh, well, they didn't really want to proceed with this free voc free polio vaccination, but that was uh, really opposed by the teachers there. On the left is a, is a young man getting the first dose of uh, vaccine in, in Marion County. Uh, I'll note that of the various manufacturers, two of them, Eli Lilly and Pittman Moore, were both in Indianapolis. So uh, a significant, um, Indianapolis played a significant role uh, in uh, success in um, getting rid of polio. And by the end of the year, the vaccines were initially made available to um, uh, youngsters, uh, individuals up to uh, 10 years of age in pregnant women. And there was, uh, by the end of the year, an effort to expand that. And also I mentioned that the supply of vaccine would be available for free distribution by physicians. Just a couple of things uh, to close out here. We can see that, um, Yearly cases before and after vaccination. Vaccines aren't perfect, but they're pretty good. And polio is certainly one of those that has done, done well. Prevalence of polio over time. The black line is the polio cases. The red line is polio deaths uh, here in the United States. And we can see uh, once you get up here to 1955, uh, how quickly it falls off. And as you get past the early 1960s, uh, very low numbers throughout. Indeed, the United States has been polio free since 1979. I've heard occasionally from uh, a traveler with polio that would come to the United States. The last time for that was in 1993. This is an image that I know you can't read, but you can certainly see the graph coming down here for the cases of polio across the world. And you can see a uh, very small numbers here. And at this point, there are two countries that have endemic polio, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that's important because as long as any polio remains anywhere, there's the potential polio spread to under vaccinated areas everywhere. Polio continues to be one of the required um, immunizations for youngsters uh, entering school in Indiana. Uh, and so that uh, is required starting in the pre-K uh, with um, additional an additional dose, depending on timing. We're a few minutes over, but uh, that's it. I hope that you've uh, learned a bit about polio in Indianapolis. We have a little time for questions, uh, if you would uh, like to do that. And um, Sarah, it's, uh, it's your program now. We, we do have... Um... A couple of questions. Uh, Richard asks, um, the, the Sabin vaccine included attenuated virus, and he asks, how is that developed? Well, the attenuated virus, you have to find some way to reduce the uh, activity of the virus. And typically, this is done research-wise by passing the virus through a series of animals. And as it goes through each generation of animal, it becomes less active. 
Now, the, the problem with the Sabin vaccine is when it was in widespread use, there were still about 20 to 30 cases of polio reported after its use. So uh, it becomes a bit um, of a gamble as, as to whether the virus has been actually attenuated enough to be uh, not produce um, infection. One important thing, uh, Bill referred to Flexner, who was the head of the Rockefeller Institute, and he was convinced that polio entered through the nasal passages. And this really set back a lot of research. And in fact, there were attempts to actually paint different chemicals, probably not very healthy chemicals, into the nose to kill the virus. And it wasn't until uh, somebody found that it actually entered through the alimentary canal. And I think it was uh, Doris Horseman who was actually able to find evidence uh, with a, uh, an antibody response early in the infection, but it was very transient, so it was missed. But uh, theories like this that become accepted really set back the research uh, quite a bit. Um, so that's the way the viruses are generally uh, attenuated. Thank you. Um, someone asked uh, about the kinds of rumors and misinformation. One of your earlier slides, I think, had a newspaper article about how that was kind of hindering progress. And, and so they ask um, for more information about what, what those rumors and misinformation were about. Okay. And there are various examples that are given in, in that and other articles. Um, Rite Aid Hospital only accepts patients on Tuesdays and Thursdays, no other time. So uh, misinformation there. Mm. A milkman on the, I think it was the west side of Indianapolis uh, was spreading information that there were 70 families on his route that had uh, polio going on, but no one was, um, was making that information public other than him. So that was some examples of some of the misinformation that was um, published in the, in the local papers and pointing out uh, that, you know, try to consider your sources uh, when you're uh, getting information about polio. <laughs> the age old problem, I guess. Uh, and on a related note, Pam asks, how would you compare vaccine hesitancy with the polio and COVID vaccines? Well, I, there were some, I think, some anti-vaxxers in polio, but it, the number was so small. I think, as Bill pointed out, the fear of polio was so extensive uh, that once the vaccine appeared, everybody rushed for it. And even, uh, I mean, I had polio in 53 and the Salk vaccine came out in 55. We lived up outside of Detroit. And up there, they were using the elementary schools as um, vaccine clinics. And despite the fact that I had had it, I think I've had every polio vaccine developed since then. My parents made sure I, I got it. Um, I think the question, as Bill said, it's who you get your information from. Uh, I'm not sure some of the football players who talk to a podcaster, that would be a reliable uh, source of information. Um, I don't think it was nearly as extensive as it is with COVID. Uh, and I'll refer back to a, a slide that I showed that had uh, five arrows coming in. Uh, and that uh, pointed out that the um, city of Indianapolis made available free vaccines through the schools to all first and second graders. And 95% of the parents um, agreed for their children to get the vaccine. Um, and of that remaining 5%, uh, a number of them said, well, you don't need to do it because I'm going to get the vaccine in, in the youngster through their own pediatrician. So uh, the numbers 
uh, I think were very high in terms of acceptance uh, of the vaccine. I think uh, there's another point to take into account here. And this is basically at the peak of the baby boom, um, 1951, 1952, 1953, um, before the vaccine comes in. This is a condition that affects young children. And um, I think there is um, almost unanimous agreement among the parents of those children um, that if there's a vaccine, they wanna get their kids vaccinated. Um, and I think that's maybe part of the difference between what we're seeing with COVID. Um, uh, the early presentations for COVID uh, were primarily with elderly people, um, people in their 70s, 80s. Um, and polio in the 1950s is attacking three-year-olds, four-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-year-olds. Um, and I think that to my way of, to my mind, that's an important distinction. Well, Bill, I, I think the baby boomer generation, we got a double whammy. We got polio as kids and now we got COVID as exactly geriatric yeah. group. Yeah, right, yeah. right. There's, there's one more question here. If you guys have uh, another minute, I know we've gone over. Um, and if, if not, I can get you guys in touch. But uh, okay. Kylie asks, on the, on the initial graph that showed the plot of polio based on morbidity and prevalence, where would you plot COVID-19 or would it even be on there? Um, it, it, would is you on need there. To oh. it is on there and I did point it out and it would take okay. me to pull this up again. But as compared to, and remember that that is looking at um, uh, polio that is affecting uh, the muscles, uh, that polio is um, more contagious and uh, more deadly than uh, COVID-19. So uh, on that graph, um, polio was up and a little bit to the right of where uh, COVID-19 would be. Thank you. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. So thank you all for joining us and thank all of you guys for being wonderful panelists. This was a great program. And uh, someone asked in the chat, but I'll say it out loud for everyone to hear. Uh, we are recording this program and it will be available on our YouTube channel and our website. So keep an eye out for that. And if you want to be uh, among the first to know when that recording is available, you can sign up for our mailing list at imhm.org. Thank you all. Thanks to all for attending. Thank you.